welcome to our uh, next class on uh, gas chromatography. We discussed a few aspects of gas chromatography in the earlier class. What I had told you was that gas chromatography differs from other forms of chromatography in that the mobile phase is a gas and uh, the components are separated as vapors. The separation is accomplished by partitioning the sample between the stationary phase and the mobile phase. And uh, the stationary phase is usually a liquid coated onto a solid uh, which is filled in a column. And uh, the sample containing the solutes is usually injected into onto a heated block where it immediately vaporizes the sample that is the analyte and then it is swept away by the carrier gas into the column inlet. The solutes are adsorbed by the stationary phase and the there will be equilibration process between the stationary phase and the uh, mobile phase and after the separation the components will emerge out one by one into different zones. So, when they come out of the column, the, they meet the registrar that means they enter the detectors and register a series of signals resulting from the concentration changes or on the mass rate change based on the mass rate change. And the rates of elution on the recorder is usually a plot of time versus the composition of the carrier gas string. So, the appearance time, height, width, area of all these peaks can be measured to yield the quantitative data. Use of longer columns and higher velocity carrier gas permits the fast separation of um, the components uh, within a matter of few minutes. So, higher working temperatures also permit the possibility of converting into a volatile component making gas chromatography one of the most versatile techniques for the separation of the components. So, what are the components of a gas chromatograph? You can see here on this slide that it consists of about 6 parts, 6 components. One component is supply of carrier gas in a high pressure cylinder with attendant pressure regulator, flow meter, needle walls etcetera. And the second component important component is sample injection system through which the samples are injected into the column. And third and the most important is the separation column that we can say is the heart of the chromatograph. And fourth one is the detector and recorder and the last one is compartments for columns and detectors. Now, what we will do is we will take a look at each of these components in a slightly detailed fashion. Now, you can see the schematic of the gas chromatograph like this. This is the first part that is the carrier gas uh, cylinder through which the gas is allowed to pass through a flow meter and then it enters a sample insertion uh, area that is the second component and uh, as the sample comes here it goes into takes the sample as a plug of vapor and then into the column separation column and then you need a detector when it emerges out of the column followed by a recorder and then a fraction collector if you are interested in collecting the sample. So, what is important to notice in these things is the sample uh, injection column, sample injector and the column and the detector and all these things are housed in thermostated compartments. That means, they are all maintained at particular temperature usually high enough to keep the components into the gaseous phase or vapor phase. 
So, now we will take a look at the components in a more detailed fashion. This is usually a typical, this is how a typical gas chromatograph looks. What you will be seeing is actually a big nice box with several um, uh, with several controls at the back and then you will see most of the there are boxes inside the box which represent thermostated compartments and here you can see the columns. So, the detectors are placed outside the column as they emerge out of the system and then insulation is a very important component. Then thermal compartments are there and then columns are there, a blower is there and then sample introduction system is here. So, the sample will be injected through the this septum using a syringe. Now, we will take a look at the each component in detail. So, let us take a look at the pressure regulator that is the carrier gas system. The carrier gas from the tank passes through a toggle ball and it has a flow meter which will give you about 1 to 1000 milliliters per minute and then it will have capillary restrictors and a pressure gauge of about 1 to 4 atmospheres. Flow rate is usually adjusted by means of a needle ball mounted on the base of the flow meter and controlled by the capillary restrictor. The operating efficiency of the gas chromatograph is directly dependent on the maintenance of the constant gas pressure. This is very important especially because the gas pressure is the one which controls the success of a chromatographic separation. So, the um, contaminants in the carrier gas are al also assume importance. So, the carrier gas should be as pure as possible and then it should be of the order of about 99 or 99.9 .9 percent purity and uh, the uh, performance of the detector is also dependent upon the purity of the carrier gas. Therefore, a molecular sieve of about 5 angstroms is usually used as a trap to remove the hydrocarbons and water vapor coming from the carrier gas that is very important. So, the pressure regulator or the carrier gas is usually taken care of it um, in this fashion to make sure that it does not have the moisture as an impure component and it does not have hydrocarbons as the uh, impurities as a, which will ensure a good performance with respect to the detector also. Usually what are the carrier gases we use in chromatography? You can use any gas for that matter, but helium seems to be the best, but helium is costly still people use helium and uh, nitrogen is another uh, a very common carrier gas. You can use hydrogen, argon etcetera. Helium is preferred as thermal conductivity detectors because of its high thermal conductivity relative to that of most of the organic vapors that you are trying to separate in general. I have to tell you at this point that uh, the the separation from a gas chromatography is 99 percent restricted to organic compounds. So, uh, with respect to uh, these things uh, organic compounds helium is a best carrier gas because of its high thermal conductivity. Nitrogen is also preferable it is cheaper uh, when large concentration of consumption of carrier gas is required, then it is better to go for nitrogen. Hydrogen and other things are used as special cases that we will see as we proceed into the more instrument. Usually liquid samples are injected by a micro syringe. You must have 
seen several syringes when you have visited a doctor and what he does is he will take the medicine in a syringe and inject you here uh, and it is essentially the same syringe, but the capacity of the syringe what we use in gas chromatography is of the order of a few microliters may be 1 or 0.5 milliliter maximum that is about 500 microliters. People do use 1 ml etcetera, but it is better to control the liquids to a few milliliter microliters I mean. The insertion of the sample is the most exacting problem in gas chromatography. What you should be doing is you are supposed to take the sample through a vial into a micro syringe and then push it through that white uh, um, the hole which I had shown as a rubber septum in my previous uh, this thing this uh, here you have to this is a rubber septum through which you have to inject the needle just like what your family doctor does it for you whenever you have to whenever you go to him. So, the insertion injection and withdrawal of the needle should be accomplished in such a way that there is no loss of the sample when you take it from the sample inject it into the gas chromatograph as well as when you pull it out. So, the liquid should be drawn out without any loss um, from the um, liquid phase and then it should be inserted into a heated column before that there should not be any loss and when you are pulling out there should not be any liquid left out into the syringe. So, this whole operation injection uh, sucking re, uh, injecting and then pulling out that itself forms a fine art usually good gas chromatographers ga, gas chromatographic uh, instrument operators usually perfect this technique. Otherwise, other people would require a little more practice to take out the sample inject it and take it out etcetera etcetera. So, the uh, whole perf uh, performance should be completed very quickly and smoothly and with reproducibility. If there is no reproducibility, what is the sanctity of analysis? So, that itself is a fine art. So, the gaseous samples, how do you inject a gaseous sample? If it is a liquid, we do it through a micro syringe. How do you do a gas sample? What you should be doing is you have to take a micro syringe which is gas tight. So, you have to inject suck the gas into a gas tight syringe and then insert it and proceed ahead as usual, but it is also possible to introduce the gas through a uh, through a or a arrangement of loops and walls. I will show you loops and walls arrangement shortly, but uh, what you should uh, remember is typical sample volumes range from 0.1 to 2 milliliters that is 200 microliters. This is how a sample inlet system looks. You see here this is a syringe and this is the piston and there is a vaporization. This is a, a chamber which is heated and carrier gas is coming through this through the side. So, the syringe is almost very near where carrier gas comes in and when you plunge the syringe plunger, it goes directly below this carrier gas and the carrier gas will be taking with it the sample vapor also. And uh, this is the syringe needle septum, this is the rubber septum which I have shown as a um, is a white uh, uh, marked uh, piece and then here you can you you can see this uh, septum purge and other things are there usually the pressure regulator is 0 0.25 psi per ml and uh, the zero dead volume connector is also connected here oh, so what it does is there should not be any volume of the sample that is retained here so, this is the dead volume uh, basically. 
So, whenever you are injecting a sample, you have to make sure that the sample does not remain here. And um, in general, that is how a liquid sample is connected, um, injected. Now, this is a gas sample injection through a wall vent uh, loop arrangement. Or uh, here, the sample um, gas is coming through and it is allowed, uh, it goes out. What we have here is a locking arrangement and uh, this is the carrier gas arrangement and that also is passing through like this. So, whenever the gas is coming through, we collect the gas here and then this uh, carrier gas is connected and takes it as a plug and directly through the loop system. So, the next part what we want to discuss is about uh, the chromatographic column. As I told you, the chromatographic column is uh, basically the heart of the gas chromatography. It is the column which is made of metals, it is a metal tube basically. It is bent in U shape or coiled into an open tube. Why do we need this uh, coiling is because it will occupy less space. So, this is how a column will uh, look this is the gas chromatographic column. This can be made of the metal as well as it can be made of glass. We will see how more about this when we discuss this further. So, uh, what I would like to say at this stage is the gas chromatographic columns are either in U shape or they are coiled into an open spiral or a flat pancake type and copper is a useful material for gas chromatography and it is useful up to 250 degree centigrade. Higher than that, it is not so useful. So, we try to look for uh, um, if your applications are within 250 degree centigrade, that means if your samples ca can be separated as vapors up to 250 degree centigrade, that means their boiling points are below 250 degree centigrade, you can use copper columns. Otherwise, you can go for steel columns or glass columns and depending upon other uh, applications. Usually, how do you fit a column to the injection tube and um, to the injector, sample injector and then you have to also to fit the column to a detector at the end. So, at all these joints, there should not be gas leakage. So, usually the arrangements are made in such a way that swage lock fittings are used to make the column insertion easy and swage lock fittings also make sure that the gas is not leaking. So, several sizes of columns are used depending upon the requirement. So, you can see here, I have listed a few column specifications in the table. You can see that I have written here parameters and these are all uh, open tubular. This is 1 16th, this is 1 8 this is 1 4th and this is 3 by 8. All these are in dimensions are in inches. So, the internal diameter is of the order of a few millimeters and in open tubular columns it is 0 0.25 to 0 0.5 millimeter and 1 16th it is about 1.2, 1 1.65, 1 3.94, 8 etcetera that is for bigger diameter columns. And then lengths, typical lengths of a column are of the order of 100 meters. So, you will imagine that if uh, a big column is to be used, it should better be in the spiral form. 
otherwise how are you going to fix a 100 meter tube into a gas chromatograph without making it look huge and its function remains the same. So, it is better to use uh, spiral columns or U tube columns to make sure that such long lengths are accommodated in the small sample size in the small uh, equipment and uh, 1 16th inch are of the order of about 20, 20, 20, 30 etcetera and the theoretical number of plates this is a very important concept and uh, these plates are of the order of about 300,000 for open tubular, 60,000 for 1 16th, 48,000 for 1 8th, 30 and 15. You can see that as the, the diameter increases plate length, plate numbers, number of plates will keep on decreasing. So, this is very logical. So, plates per meter are of the order of about 3000 to 750. So, the liquid phase we will not discuss it uh, for the time being and um, this is a approximate loading that is 3, 5, 10 and 20 percent. That means, if liquid component in the stationary column is of this order. Uh, film thickness it is in um, uh, it is in millimeter 1, 5, 10 um, it could be in microns sorry the, it, they are in 1 to 20 microns and then sample size useful for open tubular column is 0 0.01 microliters and 1 16th it is 1, 2, 10 etcetera microliters and maximum you can handle is approximately around 1000 microliter. Now, the column cannot be a, a metal tube alone because metal tube only acts as a support. Now, the column should have a solid phase on which liquid is to be coated. So, the support is filled into the column after coating the support. So, the support also plays a very big role in the separation. Therefore, the structure and surface characteristics of the support materials are also important parameters in the selection of the columns. In fact, these things determine the efficiency of the support and the degree of separation respectively. The support should be inert, it should not react with the carrier gas nor the components that is one of the requirement anyway. And uh, it, it is capable of immobilizing large volume of liquid phase, because larger the liquid phase volume the better would be the number of plates, but the thickness should be as small as possible to get more number of theoretical plates which will ensure higher degree of separation, better separation. Then the surface area it should be large to ensure rapid attainment of the equilibrium between the stationary phase and the mobile phase that is also very important. So, the support should be strong enough to withstand the breakdown in handling and be capable of being packed in a small tube to a good consistency into a, so what we are essentially looking at is the good packing of the support material in a coat a support material coated with the liquid and put into a tube and this tube should be capable of being coiled and put into the column it should be put into not column but in the oven so, what are the support materials? You can choose a number of them. One is diatomaceous earth, one is kieselgur treated with sodium carbonate. Kieselgur is another type of soil that is available 
and um, uh, it is treated with sodium carbonate with about uh, for about uh, for uh, 9 900 degree centigrade and when you take this uh, kind of uh, soil particles and mix it with sodium carbonate for about 900 degree centigrade it causes the particles to fuse together into coarser aggregates and uh, these aggregates you will have to powder them and then that is your support material so more amorph micro amorphous silica is usually converted into cristobalite that is another form of the silica uh, silica structure which is marketed as chromosorb w sea light diatopor w gas chrome anachrome etc what i am trying to tell you here is the support material is marketed separately and you can buy these things from the um, vendors who are supplying chromatographic materials they sell you sir i have a chromosorb w and another will say sir i have a sea light sir i sell only diatopor w like that there are different trade names and all these trade names of the support material actually refers to the treated um, silica with sodium carbonate at around 900 degree centigrade and then powdered into different particle sizes. So, ditomite is usually crushed, blended and calcined above 900 degrees centigrade which forms a pink powder known as chromosorb P. Chromosorb P is the trade name. Now, you would have seen this ditomite earth and um, uh, it is just the ordinary type of bricks what we use for construction in our houses. So, there are so many brick making factories and um, what is important is many of those things you would have seen after heating they get converted into pinkish uh, bricks. These things are powdered and then marketed as chromosorb P. So, there is no need to panic the moment you see here chromosorb P or something like that being marketed oh it could be something special no it is nothing very special it is just the soil heated at 900 degree centigrade and made into bricks and powdered. So, this is less fragile and it has got high density and when you powder it and pour it from the top it is very free flowing that means it does not stick to your hands or the container and it is capable of holding a large volume of liquid phase. This has about 80 percent wide space with about 9 micron size pore size and um, the one which uh, is marketed as white, white one has about 90 percent void space and 2 micron pore size. These pink columns are more efficient among the white and uh, pink materials, pink columns are usually more efficient. So, both these activities, uh, both these substances have active sites on their surfaces that is both the chromosome chromosorbs piece, uh, uh, support materials have got active silica and OH groups on their surfaces which cause usually tailing with molar more polar solutes. That means, if you have more active sites in the support material your chromatograph that is coming out at the end will have more tailing because the more is the active site more is the liquid that is sample that is held. So, it will come out slightly more slowly. These are due to metallic impurities and uh, SiOH groups, silinol groups and siloxane groups which give rise to hydrogen bonding effects. So, acid washing usually removes acid washing removes mineral impurities and reduces the surface activity 
caused by the OH groups associated with iron and aluminum and other several other metals that are there in the silenol. <coughs> Silenization by dimethyl dichlorosilane or hexamethyl disilazine you can do selenization that means you make them convert it into selenol group selenization by using dichlorosilane or hexamethyl disilazine. This reduces the surface activity that means they convert most of them into selenol groups and then there is the active sites are reduced that means there will not be any tailing there is no tailing means the peaks will be sharper. So, this um, selenization reduces the surface area of the support also uh, more than by about 10 percent and uh, loading can be approximately 10 percent loading cannot be used that means about uh, 10 percent is lost activity is lost during these processes. So, coating of the support that is now that you have the brick powder white and pink that is chromosome P's. You have the support and uh, we can uh, use uh, stearic acid to coat on the brick powder or chromosorb. It is incorporated stearic acid incorporated in silicone oil. We use them to eliminate tailing in the separation of fatty acids because stearic acid is also an acid hydrocarbon uh, compound. It is a solid compound which melts at high temperature. You can incorporate stearic acid in silicone oil and then use it on the chromosorb that will help in eliminating the tailing in the separation of fatty acids. For amines what do we do? For amines we can use potassium hydroxide treatment. So, different treatments systems are available for the support materials to be treated to avoid tailing in the end. Sometimes what we do is apart from these chromosorb we also use glass beads. So, glass beads with a low surface area and low porosity they can also be used to coat. You can use up to 3 percent of the stationary phase and um, to coat and then usually about 0 0.05 to 0.2 percent loadings permit the analysis of high boiling substances at fairly low temperatures. Now, you can see that uh, apart from the chlorine uh, apart from the glass beads you can use porous polymer beads. You would have seen number of porous polymer beads like they look like ion exchange resins small small uh, white transparent beads or uh, you would have seen polystyrene beads uh, which are uh, um, used in the exhibitions and other places. You can use polystyrene also. Such beads differing in the degree of cross linking of uh, styrene with alkyl vinyl benzene are used which are stable up to 250 degree centigrade. Usually polymer beads even though they are used as supports you cannot use them at very high temperature because they themselves will start disintegrating at higher temperature. We do not want that to happen. So, there is a limit to which you can use glass beads also or um, plastic uh, uh, beads polymer beads and uh, such polymer beads are marketed with, uh, with uh, trade names starting from P that is they are marketed as pora pack, pora pack P pora pack Q, pora pack R, pora pack S etcetera which represent different types of loading of the liquid onto the polymer resins. 
So, the mesh size of the support that is the particle size of the support determines the average particle diameter which in turn determines the HATP that is the theoretical number of plates, height of the effective theoretical number of the plate. Therefore, theoretically smallest particles should be used because that will give you better efficiency, more number of plates. So, but it causes the permeability which is essentially a product of the particle, it is proportional to the particle diameter, square of the particle diameter and pressure drop, it is uh, the permeability also will uh, reduce the pressure drop in longer columns. Coarser particles can be used to reduce the pressure drop. Best columns are those with 80 to 100 mesh. Now, the 80 to 100 mesh particle sizes you cannot use in very small columns. So, the optimum size of the column also is important. So, 80 by 100 mesh size of the chromosome or a support material or whatever it is, you can fill comfortably in 1 8 inch and higher columns. So, 1 8 inch with diatomaceous earth type supports, they are usually very comfortable. So, for effective packing of any column, the internal diameter should be about 8 times the width of the 8 times the diameter of the supports. This is a general empirical rule that is the internal diameter should be at least 8 times the diameter of the supports, support material. Now, let us discuss about the liquid phases. So, the liquid phases are uh, uh, usually um, you can have a number of liquid phases, they are readily available and their use is only limited by their volatility, thermal stability and ability to wet the support. This, uh, it is a very important parameter, the support must also be wetted by the liquid to form a thin film membrane over the material. So, no single phase actually will serve for all separation column, there is no panacea. You have to try to understand what kind of materials you are separate, uh, you, want, you want to separate and there is a requirement which will satisfy the column material, column support etcetera. And um, the liquid phase, there are a number of them which will satisfy, but there is no single phase that will serve for all separation problems at all the temperatures. We have to understand this in, in a very clear manner because um, this will tell you that you will have to buy a number of columns or a variety of columns to achieve the separation of a variety of substances. That means, if your samples are varied, if they, uh, if they have compositions which are different from uh, from uh, known compose from known compositions, you have to have more number of columns with different liquid supports. So, what we can do is we can classify them into two or three, so two or three classes. One is nonpolar, and uh, the liquid phase non-polar means you can the examples are like this paraffin, squalane, silicone greases, apizon L and silicone gum rubber that is known as marketed as a trade name marketed by a trade name known as SC 30 
and all these things are basically non-polar liquid substances of very high molecular weights. These materials separate the separate the components in the order of their boiling points. That means, if you have hydrocarbons, you want to separate them and um, their boiling points are different, then what you should do is you should choose a column with a support material um, coated with paraffins, squalane, silicon greases, apison, silicon gum rubber etcetera. One of these things will do. So, if you uh, want to separate materials which are partly polar and partly non-polar that is intermediate polarity, then what you should do is you should uh, dissolve uh, a liquid known as diethyl hexyl phthalate onto the you should coat these substances diethyl hexyl phthalate onto the liquid support. And then the that can be used for the separation of higher boiling alcohols. Usually alcohols are having higher uh, polarity compared to hydrocarbons. So, if you want to separate the alcohols, you can go for these uh, um, uh, such liquids and then you can have polar substances. You want to separate only the polar substances, then in that case the carboaxis are required and liquid phases with large proportion of polar groups and separation of uh, which will help in the separation of polar as well as non-polar substances that is also possible. So, depending upon the polarity and the boiling point you can choose different kinds of so, liquid support, liquid, um, liquid phase and the support also. Sometimes you, can, you may have um, substances which will form uh, hydrogen bonds for example, glycol. The glycols have a possibility for forming hydrogen bonds uh, and uh, these things will have this hydrogen will form a weak bond with oxygen and then this will be hydrogen, this will be another uh, molecule CH2, CH2, OH and uh, this hydrogen can also form a very weak bond with another oxygen like that several uh, substances are capable of forming these hydrogen bonds. These uh, hydrogen bonds similarly alcohols, water and so many other substances will form hydrogen bonds. So, you can uh, go back and see whether your substances you want to separate are capable of forming the hydrogen bonds or not. So, in such cases polar liquid phases with higher um, hydrogen bonding usually for go for glycol, this should not have been there bonding, but we will correct them if possible. So, specific pur purpose phases we can uh, have apart from the polar, non-polar and then intermediate polar as well as uh, hydrogen bonding etcetera. So, these things reliable rely on a chemical reaction with the solute to achieve separations. For example, I can use AG silver nitrate in glycol to separate the unsaturated hydrocarbons from a given mixture of the sample. Suppose, you have hydrocarbons 
and you want to mix with unsaturated hydrocarbons, you can simply pass them through a column containing silver nitrate in glycol and then they will retain the unsaturated hydrocarbons. The maximum temperature at which a liquid phase may be used is determined by its volatility. Now, again we are coming back to the generalities. So, the maximum temperature at which a liquid phase may be used is determined by its volatility. If it is uh, volatile, you need not raise the temperature of the column much higher than its volatilization temperature. So, excessive volatility, suppose you raise the column temperature to very high level, then the liquid will decompose to some extent. So, the excessive volatility usually shortens the column life, it contaminates the gas stream and then it affects the baseline stability also. The operating temperature is usually determined by its viscosity and solidification point. That is what I want to convey to you that whenever you want to make any separation on the gas chromatographic column do not raise the column temperature much higher than the boiling points of the components what you want to use. So, the maximum temperature should be just about 10 or 15 degrees higher than the maximum boiling temperature component of your sample. So, uh, another aspect that is column loading, how much you want to how much you would like to load your columns with the liquid that is mobile phase, no sorry stationary phase. Usually 15 percent loading we have an expression whenever you want to buy a column for gas chromatography we will say but the vendor will tell you sir I have a pora pack column with 15 percent loading. So, what does it mean? It means it, he, the column has got the 15 percent liquid phase and 85 percent of it is support. The lower the amount of the solid phase, the smaller is the sample that can be handled. So, higher loading more is the sample that can be separated. So, this point I want to convey to you that it is a an important information whenever you want to buy a column. So, there are other kinds of uh, columns which are known as open tubular columns. If I if you remember my previous uh, so one of the previous slides in which I showed the, the characteristics of the columns, you can see that I have put open tubular columns here and uh, the first one is open tubular columns and its ID is 2.252.5 mm and it shows highest number of theoretical plates. And now, I am going to discuss a little bit about this just to give you an idea about the open tubular columns. So, what is an open tubular column? It is basically a capillary column that is a glass tube with 0.5 mm diameter. So, the diameter of the tube is about 0.5 and you have to load the liquid, coat the liquid inside the capillary and this permits the use of very long columns almost about 30 to 100 meters. So, all the capillary columns must be you must be in a position to coil them round and round and round which I had shown you in my previous one of the window journal programs and the whole thing should be fit fitable to the sample injection unit as well as to the detector outside and the whole thing should be put in the 
oven that is thermal compartment. So, this permits the use of very long columns and because of the, the because the tube is open there is nothing inside except the walls of the capillary are coated with the liquid. In general it is a uh, empty tube. So, uh, because of the low pressure they will not have present much pressure uh, drop. Because of the pressure drop such columns give a high overall column efficiency. So, theoretical plates of 100,000 are also possible in um, such cases the diameter could be 0 0.07 to 0 0.25 mm, but the sample capacity is only uh, about 0 0.1 to 0 0.3 percent of the normal samples. Then we can discuss a little about support coated open tubular columns. These are known as fuzzy woozy columns. A thin layer of the porous material is usually deposited on the inner wall of the open tube and then coated with a liquid phase. This causes the internal surface area also to increase. That is a very important concept in fuzzy woozy columns because of the coating of the liquid inside the capillary the surface area increases. Therefore, the beta value and the film thickness are reduced by an order of the magnitude. Beta is the incompressibility of the uh, liquid. So, fewer theoretical plates are necessary that means, you can use shorter columns fewer theoretical columns or plates are necessary and resulting in the shorter analysis time. Shorter column means shorter they come out faster. So, the analysis time gets shortened and then it uh, you will get a better resolution, uh, resolution also because basically you are increasing the surface area which will result in better separation. So, now let us uh, stop our discussion on the columns, um, but go on to the detectors. I would like to say at this stage that the detectors usually sense the arrival of the separated components and provide a signal. The job of the detector is to sense the arrival of the separated component and it has to give a signal. So, they can be either concentration dependent or they can be mass dependent. That means, when the sa sample is coming out of the column, the detector should sense as the column as the concentration of the outcoming component increases, it should give you a peak something like this. this is a concentration dependent peak. So, as the concentrate this is your basically carrier gas. So, as the carrier gas um, as the sample increases the signal will increase reach its maximum and as it reduces it will come down again to the carrier gas level. So, the job of the detector is to identify this peak that is you can identify this peak either as a of the sample by its specific properties related to concentration or you can use simply the carrier gas. Take the carrier gas and as the sample increases 
as the sample comes out the mass of the material reaching the detector will increase. So, long as the uh, component is not separated it will be, sh be showing you a steady concentration st or steady baseline. The moment a sample component comes out, the moment the sample component comes out the signal will be higher. So, this is known as mass dependent detector. So, the you can use either a concentration detector like uh, this uh, like this or a mass detector either way the detectors can be characterized. So, the signal to noise ratio is uh, twice for the smallest signal the detector should be close to the column exit that is a very important concept and the correct temperature also it must show to prevent decomposition. What we will do is we will discuss more about the detectors and the applications of gas chromatography in the next class.